Heavenly Father, lead us to serve you humbly, with obedience, with our only concern being what is pleasing to you. Bless us this morning, Holy Spirit, that my words would be yours and that our hearts, our minds, and our lives would become what you want them to be. Father, together we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Our message text this morning is the book of Philemon. Philemon, sorry. And you say, you're going to read a whole book? I, it's 25 verses long. I think we can handle this one. Uh, it says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints that have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of you, your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. For I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I, I should have checked this. Did the translation on the screen say bond servant or slave? Ah, I wasn't filling that in here. This says slave. And the word, the word in Greek is doulos. And there's really no reason to translate it as anything other than slave. The reason that so many English translations say something like bond servant or servant, or actually that's pretty much they use bond servant and servant, is because we, we have a really bad connotation with slavery, right? In this country, slavery was a terrible atrocity based almost solely on race. When the Bible uses the word slavery, that is not what they're talking about. Okay? Because in the biblical times, especially in the Jewish culture, slavery was not about race. For most of them, it was an economic arrangement. It wasn't a pleasant one, but the reality was if you had debts that you could not afford to pay back, you paid them back by letting yourself out as a slave or by, unfortunately, selling your family members into slavery to pay off your debt. So unfortunate, yes. Does it have the same like default ethical, this is terrible? Not necessarily. Um, it did get worse if you look into the Roman and the Greek culture because then it also included slaves from war or slaves from conquest. But especially in the Jewish culture, it was more of an economic thing. 
and they had extensive rules in the Old Testament to ensure the humane treatment of slaves. We don't think of that, though. When we hear the word slavery, it is housed in American slavery. So, all of that is to say, when tra English translations of the Bible decide we're going to use the word servant instead of slave, I get it. I understand why we do it at the same time. Um, slave is an incredibly helpful term for understanding our relationship with Christ. And what I find interesting, and the reason I bring all this up, Onesimus, who's referenced in this letter, was Philemon's slave. And from what we can gather, Onesimus ran away from Philemon and robbed him before he left. And now Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon. And what I find really interesting is the way Paul is speaking, it actually puts all three of these parties into a position of service or of slavery. Because it's service without pay, so slavery. You see, because Paul is, is submitting himself to both Philemon and to some level to Onesimus. He's saying, I could command you and tell you what to do, but out of love, I'm going to do this instead. And then he's asking Philemon to serve Paul by letting Onesimus continue to serve Paul instead of pursuing Philemon's interest. And then, obviously, he's sending Onesimus back into a situation of slavery. So it's interesting to me that all three of the parties here, to one degree or another, are put into this position of slavery. And this kind of caught my ear especially because there's, there's a book that I read um, a while back. And I didn't look up the author. I don't remember who the author is. It's called Slaves of Christ, A New Testament Metaphor for Total Devotion to Christ. Um, it is a good book. I would recommend it if you're really bored. Um, but even today, you and I, we are called to be slaves of Christ. And in that relationship with God that we have, we are instructed also to serve one another, which makes a worthwhile question. What we're going to dive into today is, what does it mean to be a slave of Christ? And this is from the book. This is what, how he defines slavery to Christ. As Christ's purchased possession, the Christian is wholly devoted to the person of the Master. Okay, And that's kind of where he starts with how do we define this, re this relationship we are slaves of Christ. And it's complete devotion to Christ if we're going to boil that down. This is our base definition. And I think when we define it like that, I think we're good, right? Like that's a definition. None of us is like, ah, oh, complete devotion to Christ. I can't sign off on that. Okay, no one's, no one's kicking me out yet. No one looks terribly offended yet. Well, we'll see how, how we go. Um, and this author, and I, I'm going to come back to him a couple times because I think his analysis of this is phenomenal. He explains that slavery to Christ, this, this total devotion to Christ, it has three distinct elements. And here's the first one. The first is a humble submission to Christ, giving him absolute and exclusive rights to our will, affections, and energy, now and forever. So what does this total submission look like practically? It means that every single part of our life is submissive to the will of Christ. So when we are outlining our schedules, when we're going through and we're planning our calendar out, when there is a conflict between anything that we're doing and then our devotion or our, our time of worship, that submits to our time of worship and devotion. Church isn't what gets canceled, everything else is. Or when we're looking at our finances, and the economy is tightening, and inflation is getting worse and worse and worse, and we're looking, how do we cut back? All of the other things in our budget are what are in submission to our giving to the things of God. When church, or when our faith, is pushing us in an uncomfortable direction, when we're being pushed maybe to witness something, to someone and that's not our comfort zone or 
or we're being pushed to do something or serve in some way that's not in our comfort zone, our comfort, our desire for comfort is in submission to the will of Christ. So we suck it up. If we're in relationships with people, this is friends, this is family, this is significant others, and they are unavoidably, and I use that word very intentionally, when they are unavoidably pulling us away from God, that relationship too is in submission to our relationship with God. And when we face temptation, no matter how appealing doing something wrong is, no matter how encouraging maybe the people around us are, our desire to do that thing that is against God's will is in submission to God's will for us. And this is in this humble submission where we say, you know what, it doesn't matter what I think, it's what God is telling me to do. It's what God is challenging me to do. That is not something we are really comfortable with in any relationship we have. And in reality, I I don't know that there are many relationships in this world that describe that as readily as slavery. Because there is no other relationship where you are willing to submit everything to someone else. So I think it's really helpful. But the reality is, I've ruined your kid's marker, Trevor. Sorry. The reality is we can't do that. Right? Um, If if we go through that list again, when the calendar, sometimes you just, you can't, you can't really choose. You either have to drop out of something entirely, or you're going to miss church a week. I understand that's a reality we have to face. Or when it comes to the economy, right? You have to pay rent. You have to pay your mortgage. You have bills to pay. There comes a point where you're like, I can't give. I have bills to pay. I get it. When there are certain relationships in our life that we can't afford to cut off, even though they're pulling us away from where we need to be, there are all these instances where the reality of the world we live in keeps us away from that total humble submission. That doesn't make it right but it does make it a reality we have to contend with. And it doesn't get easier because the second element of slavery to Christ that this author talks about is this. Unquestioning obedience. Who here is comfortable with unquestioning obedience? Any taker? I know, no you are not. (laughs) Okay, I'll give you that. And that's an important point. This depends on the situation. Because and you're right to not raise your hand. Because throughout human history, there are way too many examples of terrible atrocities taking place because people were unquestioningly obedient. Whenever you see someone in, in power and all of their followers are unquestioningly obedient, You're about to make some history books a little bit bigger because there are atrocities right around the corner. Okay? At the same time, I want to reframe it. uh, And I want you to think of a boss. Call him a CEO. A CEO of a company. And this CEO has worked his way up through the company. He actually built it from the ground up. He has worked in every department. He wrote all the policy manuals, all the procedures. He intimately knows every single element of the company. He takes time out of every week to make sure he's connecting with the employees. He knows them. He knows about the families. He knows their life situations. And all he wants to do is the company to succeed and to care for his employees. Okay, so this is the CEO we have set up, this mythical creature we're calling him. Because I've never had a boss like that. (laughs) Now, this guy, he, he calls down to the mailroom in his company. And he reaches the intern in the mailroom and he says, hey, I have this memo. I need you to send this memo out to everyone in the company. And that mailroom intern looks at said memo in all of his college interning wisdom and says, ooh, that's going to be bad for company morale. This CEO is obviously out of touch with everything that's going on and doesn't send the memo. Thinking. 
this college intern does, and he has done a good thing. Until two weeks later, and the federal government comes down and shuts down the whole company because they're not in compliance with the thing that the memo would have put them in compliance with. Okay? If that intern had just unquestionably said, you know what, the CEO knows what he's doing, I'm going to send it out, is what it is, they would have been fine. Instead, the company crashed, everybody got fired. Now, I say this mythical figure of the CEO because that's not a reality we experience, right? No one is really wholly invested in everyone below them, which is why we question things. That's why unquestioning obedience is such a sensitive and untenable subject for us. But God is perfect. God knows what's going on. And even if we don't see his plan, it is for the best. So we unquestionably obey him because we know that he has our best interest at heart. And no, he, he didn't show this any more so than he did in the person of Jesus who came to this earth, who walked among people like us, who suffered, who died, and paid our price in full. The cost of everything we have ever done wrong, the cost of everything anyone has ever done wrong, he took it upon himself, he paid it on the cross. And that incredible gift, that is what paid the price for us. When we define ourselves as slaves of Christ, the cross is when he paid for us. It is when he bought us away from sin and death and the devil. That slavery, that total obedience we have to Christ, that total devotion to Christ, it calls us into humble submission and to unquestioning obedience because we know how much He loves us. Because we know how much He cares for us. Because we know about His forgiveness and His mercy. And it brings us to this, this final element of what it means to be a slave of Christ, and that is an exclusive preoccupation with pleasing Christ. And at this point, you can tell this guy's an academic because he's using these words. Translated, all you're worried about is making Jesus happy. That's what this is in like colloquial English. English. That's not the word I meant to say. Colloquial Eng English. Those words do not go well together. If you're ever thinking, should I pair colloquial and English together? The answer is no. You shouldn't. It doesn't work. Um, but with this, all we are worried about is pleasing Christ. And the reason we're going to close on this, other than that's how he wrote it, is because when we're thinking about the reason we're, we're unquestionably obedient and we're humbly submissive is because of what he has done for us. Because he paid for us with his own blood. This is our response. All we are worried about is pleasing Christ. And I think this, this probably looks different. For, for everyone. What process do we go through to get there? But for me, it's an internal dialogue. It is a conversation I have with myself, and it actually, it comes from a sermon that I heard when I was in high school. And if you ask me, the sermons I remember from when I was in high school, there are two. This one, and then one where he dressed up in like, football pads because he was doing the full armor of God and that was his bit. So he put on over, like he was wearing the robe and everything and he put on the pads and the helmet and everything else. It was really goofy. And this one, because he, he was railing on, has anyone ever seen the WWJD bracelets? Everybody, everybody at some point has seen those. What would Jesus do? And he was like, that's a stupid question. Because if you go to visit a loved one in a hospital and you say, what would Jesus do? Boom, healed. You can't do that. I can't do that. So this pastor reframed the question and he said, instead, we should be asking ourselves, what would Jesus have me? And I got to tell you, this is the question that rings in my head when I am trying to get here. And I'll tell you, after that sermon, when I was in high school through college, I didn't ask that question a lot. It was only when I was like 
dealing with serious life decisions that I was thinking about for weeks that this question came up at some point. But I asked myself occasionally. And then it got a little more frequent. And then it got a little more frequent. And, and all that practice, asking this question to yourself again and again and again, it ingrains it in your thought process. So I, I'm not expecting, I'm not saying that you, you're going to be able tomorrow to change your life until you only have this concern with pleasing Christ. But if we start asking this question, we'll start asking it more, and we'll get there. And it takes practice. So we're going to start off together this morning. We're going to put the line up on the screen, and we're going to read it together, okay? Are we ready for this? Three, two, one. What would Jesus have me do? All right, again. There we go. Just ask that question again and again and again, and eventually you'll ask. It's just since it's Mother's Day. A lot of times when I'm making decisions, I hear the voice of my mom in the back of my head say, you shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. Don't do that. So right next to your mom's voice telling you not to do stupid stuff, add this question. What would Jesus have me do? And to help kind of put this before you, I, I, did, I made a graphic that you are free to use as a lock screen or as a home screen on your phone. Okay, if you are part of our text list, at noon today, you are going to get this picture automatically. Download it, use it. If you're not on our text list, you can pull it from our Facebook page, download it, use it. And it's really simple. It's a kind of cool background, and it says, what would Jesus have me do? And the reason I did this, the reason I put this out there, is because for better or for worse, almost all of our interactions and business in this world goes through our phones. So let's put this reminder there. So every time we look at our phones, every time we have to unlock or whatever, we get this reminder, what would Jesus have to do? And we get this exclusive preoccupation with Christ. Amen. Now may our Heavenly Father who did so much for us, who paid the price for each and every one of us, keep our hearts, our minds, and our lives rooted in the gospel and walking in faith. Amen.